What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Today we're going to be talking about the running backs that have gained the most value after the draft this season, talking about where I have them right now, why, maybe what their upside is this season. First off, I want to mention uh, a few free agents that are still out there. So nothing's locked in yet. We had the draft, but there are still some running backs that could join teams, kind of mess things up for us in fantasy. Leonard Fournette, Ezekiel Elliott, Kareem Hunt, Latavius Murray, and Jerick McKinnon. Those are the ones I'd be looking at to say if one of those is added to a backfield, that might be a problem. We do still have the lingering situations around Joe Mixon, his potential suspension, could be even getting cut by the Bengals, though we're going to talk about in this video. That might not be the case given what happened in the draft. And then Dalvin Cook, that's more a contract situation. Is he going to remain on the team? Then he might become a free agent. We'll see where he lands. So not counting those, again, the five I mentioned, Zeke, Fournette, Hunt, Murray, uh, McKinnon, all could land somewhere, kind of ruin the backfields we're talking about today. So just keep that in the back of your mind before you maybe like, you're doing underdog draft, you go all in on one of these guys, you're like, let's go, great draft, they're going to be awesome, that could still happen. So who are we still going to talk about though? Jameer Gibbs. An obvious winner, and just a note, we're going to kind of go in order of like where I have them draft. I'm going to tell you where I have everyone ranked, but we're going in order here. So first up, Gibbs, I had him closer to like a fifth round pick before the draft, just not knowing, you know, is he going to slip and go, you know, 45th overall, maybe to a worse team? No, he goes incredibly early. I believe it was 12th overall phenomenal landing spot landing on the Detroit Lions. The Lions have a top five offense. He's an elite pass catcher. They trade away DeAndre Swift. I mean, Gibbs is basically just going to be what we wanted Swift to be. That That's really what it's going to come down to. Uh, if you look at a tweet that Scott Barrett sent out, the Lions backfield averaged over 28 expected fantasy points per game last season. Nine more than Eckler. 10 more than McCaffrey, and you're like, well, yeah, it's split amongst multiple backs. Okay, if Gibbs gets 55%, that's being conservative, let's be honest, 55% aligns backfield, makes him Jonathan Taylor, 66% he's McCaffrey, 70% he's Eckler from last season. I mean, like, given how talented he is, how much they like him, you look at, you know, uh, the videos from the draft room when they were able to land him. They're in love with this kid. They're going to use him a ton. He's got an amazing shot to finish as a running back one this season. So I genuinely feel like I'm being conservative with this projection. Has him as a late second round pick right now. Clear value and underdog where he's going. Another big time riser, I alluded to it before, Joe Mixon. Um, I had him as a mid-fifth round pick before. I was pretty confident they were going to spend uh, at least a relatively early pick on running back. It wasn't a strong running back class. That's kind of what's fed into uh, some, some of these backfields just not adding anyone because it's like, well, you're not going to go out of your way to draft someone in the third round when they're not all that good, right? Like, it was a very top-heavy running back class. Uh, but, you know, they left with only Chase Brown in the fifth round to go along with Travian Williams uh, and, and Chris Evans. Like, it's a bad backfield. It's really not a good backfield. Uh, Chase Brown, perfectly fine player, but, you know, not going to overtake Joe Mix. He's going to be a really, really good complementary piece. And I think that's the thing. If they were expecting to need to cut him, expecting like a big suspension or something like that, I can't imagine they would only draft a complimentary piece. And maybe in their eyes, they are looking at the free agents like, hey, if he gets suspended, if we can't have him for a chunk of the year, like we can still add someone in free agency. And so maybe that's in the back of their mind. That's why they're doing that. But right now, if you just look after the draft, he's a pretty clear winner. I'm not moving him up to where he used to be in fantasy because the risk is still there with him. But I moved him into uh, the middle of the fourth round. And if we ever get word he's not going to be suspended, we get word that like they're definitely not cutting him, he's going to go up higher than that. I mean, he was slipping really, really late on underdog going into the draft. Like You were able to get him incredibly late and create some really cool builds around that. He's going to go earlier now. Again, I have him as a mid-fourth round pick, and we'll see what happens with the court case. Uh, sticking in that same like general range, Isaiah Pacheco, uh, the Chiefs spent 
Just two picks on offense as a whole this year, a second rounder on Rasheed Rice, you know, a sleeper we talked about before the draft, and then a third rounder on an offensive lineman. Now, there's also no guarantee that Jarek McKinnon re-signs. If you look at the projections right now, the detailed projections, you'll see I do still have McKinnon on Kansas City because I think the most likely outcome is that he does. But what I'm kind of saying here is like, even if that happens, which I have projected to happen, the fact that they didn't go after a running back that we know behind Pacheco right now is Clyde and the Michael P. Ryan. And if we just look historically at like what these running backs have done in their careers, Pacheco's been the best one. So, you know, pretty good chance among those guys, he's going to be the top running back. Now there's a chance that they don't even have Jarek McKinnon, but even if he's there, I have him as a fifth rounder right now because that's really where he's being projected at. And it's like upside from there. That's why I'm more confident taking him now. Before it was like, okay, he projects around, I think it was around the sixth round before, but we've got McKinnon maybe being there. We've got maybe them drafting a running back, just like a lot of unknowns. But now when you throw out the possibility of having one of those running backs in the draft, even projecting McKinnon there, he projects really, really well, great offense good running back um basically unless they add you know one of these free agents he's going to be a really nice mid-round pick this season another running back to gain a lot of value was Rashad White Tampa Bay chose not to draft a single running back but they did sign Sean Tucker very shortly after the draft uh Tucker was projected to go if you looked pre-draft before the reports came out about the potential heart condition Around the fourth round, so that's kind of where people were viewing him, which, you know, in this class, off the top of my head, would put him roughly in that running back, like, six, seven, eight range, like, in general there. So, like, you know, decently quality running back, some good upside. Um, We know very little now about the heart condition. We know that's why he fell out of the seventh round, wasn't even drafted, but the upside is there. So, I wouldn't go all in and say that, well... They didn't draft anyone, you know, Sean Tucker's just like a an undrafted free agent. Those very rarely work out. Well, they do work out sometimes. And I would say with Tucker, it's because of the condition. It's not because of his ability. And so if he's able to play, he's still a good prospect that could command a larger workload than people think. So keep that in the back of your mind. But the top backups right now after Tucker are, you know, Chase Edmonds, who like crushed all of our, all of our souls last season. Um Keyshawn Vaughn has never been good, never going to be good. Uh, Patrick Laird, let's be honest, not going to do anything. So White is very clearly the running back one right now. And so the risk is really just twofold. One, what I said before, if Sean Tucker is cleared to play, he's a good running back. A lot of people that really liked him, he could still touches. But then number two, uh, the team was ranked 27th in touchdowns last season with Brady. Now they've got a combo of Baker and Kyle Trask so if you're looking at it from that perspective being like they're not going to be good like they're going to be a bottom seven offense in scoring the season that's pretty much a lock to happen and the lead running back on offenses like that struggle more they can still be great especially when you're a phenomenal pass catcher like Rashad White is he had what like 50 receptions last season did phenomenal it's just harder when your team is losing more you're not ahead so you're not able to get a lot of these carries Um, And you're just not able to score a lot of touchdowns if your team isn't in the red zone, isn't scoring a lot of touchdowns. So still risk with drafting White. I don't want to like oversell how good the draft was, but it was good. He's a clear winner after the draft, has a chance to have a highly productive season. Even with these risks, he could go out there, have 65 receptions, run for a thousand yards, score 10 total touchdowns. That's in his range of outcomes. And so... Moved him up, clear winner, really good, high upside mid-round pick. Another big-time winner, J.K. Dobbins. And I actually think, so he rose for two reasons for me. One was obviously, you know, the draft went fantastic for him, right? I mean, they drafted two offensive linemen late, uh, Flowers in the first round, but no running backs, didn't add any running backs in free agency. Uh, Number two, Lamar's deal gets done. Like, that was, it was like a risk. I, I 
feel like, you know, we all kind of knew he wasn't going anywhere, right? I never projected him to leave. He was always projected on the Ravens. So that wasn't like a huge risk. But whatever risk there was that Lamar was gone is gone now. That's not a risk anymore. Whatever risk there was that they drafted running back high is gone. They didn't do that. And so the only thing that can happen right now is that they bring in a free agent, which seems more likely on other teams. I don't know. It feels like they like Dobbins. They like Gus. And so it seems like they're going to stick with them. And so we look back to last season and it's like, well, obviously we can't count the production from like Dobbins, Edwards, but I feel like people maybe don't view the offense as good as they should because we had Lamar getting hurt. Bateman got hurt. Duvernay got hurt. As I said, Dobbins, Gus, they're working back from these major injuries. Like, of course the offense wasn't going to be consistently good. But you fast forward to this season, you've got Lamar coming back, hopefully staying healthy this season. Three wide receiver sets, Odell, Flowers, Bateman. That's really, really good. You've got Dobbins and Gus, probably both 100% or at least very, very close to 100%. They had major knee injuries. So it's, you know, we're not expecting at all last season. They were even close to 100%. They didn't look 100% either. Should be this year. And so this is going to be an elite offense once again. Dobbins still just 24 years old, now two years removed from the ACL tear. So I think I was just like a little bit too low beforehand. And then the really good outcome from the draft really just gave me a lot more confidence in ranking him higher. So I now have him as a late fifth round pick. You can't move him up too much because he's never going to have a lot of receptions. It's just not in his range of outcomes. But the touchdowns can be there. The yards can be there talented running back. I think the late fifth round makes sense. I would not be shocked if I saw him move up in my rankings this summer. Moving back a little bit into the sixth round, we've got Damian Pierce. Uh, the Texans obviously drafted Stroud uh, second overall. They took two offensive linemen. They took two wide receivers, but no running backs. That leaves Damian Pierce and Singletary as the locked in top two running backs on this depth chart. Um, Mike Boone, is Mike Boone, like maybe analytics community likes him a little bit, but it, like he's Mike Boone, he's not going to do anything. Um, Agumba Wale behind him, not going to do anything. And so the really the only issue you can point to, which is a real issue, obviously, is that, well, it's the Texans, right? I mean, even if you get a huge workload of a really bad offense, the offense can still hold you back. But let's not forget, I mean, Pierce was really good last season. Running back 15 through week 14, then of course suffers the ankle sprain. Um, we don't technically know how bad the ankle sprain was because they were going to shut him down. Like even if it was possible, like what if they were a playoff team, right? Could he have returned in the playoffs? I mean, probably that's kind of what it seemed like, um, but we don't know exactly how bad it was, but he's going to be fully over that. Um, just don't want people to think, oh, he's like injury prone or something like that because he suffered a season ending ankle injury. Like it was, you know, week 14, week 15, their season was done. They shut him down, right? That's not like a huge concern for us or at all a concern for us moving forward. Again, really good, really productive, like great as a rookie. And if you've watched this channel for a while, you know, I'm not in love with Devin Singletary. Like he's a good running back. He's a fine running back. I think he's overrated. I don't think he's that amazing. And so I do think that Pierce is locked in as their running back one. And so I moved him up from the early seventh round to the early sixth round after the draft and them not drafting any running backs. Moving a bit further in the draft, uh, Devon A. Chain, mid ninth round. I had a feeling Miami would draft a running back and we knew, you know, whatever running back they drafted, as long as it wasn't, you know, like the seventh round, some running back we hate, like if we liked them at all, we were going to like that landing spot because just think about this offense. Number one, great offense. There's plenty of touchdowns, plenty of productions. You can't exactly stack the box when you've got Waddle and Tyree kill out there. Like you have to be accounting for that. And so running backs are going to be productive. It's just a great situation. But you look at the players too, Mostert's 31. And while he's coming off a really good season, I can't imagine they envision him getting, you know, 200 plus touches again this season. I don't think that's in their plans. They like him. They're going to use him. I cannot see him getting over 200. I think it's over 210 touches again. And then you look at Jeff Wilson. He's fine, but like, you know, he's Jeff Wilson. You know, like 
he's just fine. He, he's not going to have a crazy high ceiling. The team's not as in love with Jeff Wilson as they are with Mostert. The team really does like Mostert, even if it's just like as a person, as a player, like they like him. They want him at least on the roster. But Devon A. Chain's good, right? He's incredibly fast. Um, going in the third round signals, they have confidence in him. Six running back off the board, decent investment. He is only 188 pounds. And so we can't look at this and be like, oh, is he going to like break out, you know, 250 touches, running back one? No, it's pretty unlikely that, that happens. But at this spot in the draft, you don't need that to happen. You can have, you know, solid running back two production in fantasy and definitely um, provide your return on that draft capital. And again, it's just like everything was awesome about this landing spot. The offense, the scheme, not having too much talent ahead of him on the depth chart. So I moved him from the late 10th into like the mid 9th range. And to be honest, if we're looking at the rookie running backs, not many of them moved up, right? They kind of slipped in the draft besides obviously we've got the top two going very early. But most running backs did not have a great landing spot. Um, did not go very early. And so many of them fell. So to see one that rose, you know, over a round, that says a lot. It was a phenomenal landing spot for him. Our final running back, definitely controversial. Uh, and I kind of went back on what I said before, uh, but it's Deuce Vaughn. Uh, if you remember back to the running back, like rookie rankings pre-draft, I said that my model is assuming around pick 150 is where he gets taken. And it's very sensitive to that. So as he moved up, pick 140, pick 130, you know, the outcome was getting a lot, a lot better because it was signaling that teams were not concerned about the weight and the height. As it moved back, the model was like, well, okay, you know, if he's going in pick 200, teams are clearly afraid, not going to give him the opportunity, tanks his projection. He goes at pick 212. So that's bad, right? But... And I, I think that signaled that a lot of teams just like completely crossed off the board. Here's the thing though. I don't see how you can watch, maybe I'll link in the description, that video of when they drafted him. I don't see how you can watch that and not think he's at least going to be given an opportunity. And that is all that we have been asking with Deuce. There are a number of teams that would never have even given him an opportunity to produce. He's going to have a role on this team. He could absolutely just be a bust, be not that good. But the Dallas Cowboys are going to give him a chance. He was highly productive in college. I do think he can have a good career in the NFL. He will never, ever be someone who's putting together like 225 carries, 70 receptions, getting all these touches as a clear running back one. That is not going to happen, but we don't need it to happen in the later rounds, at least this late in the draft. Again, Pollard is going to be the clear cut running back one for the Dallas Cowboys. That is going to happen. But that can be true and also say that this is a great landing spot for Deuce, that he can rack up receptions, he can be used in this offense. If there happens to be a two-week stretch where Pollard gets injured and they don't want to bring in another running back, they want to give Deuce, you know, 12 carries, seven receptions, like most scoring formats, he has a chance to hit that and be productive. Again, we're going to learn a lot more about how they view him this summer, what role he could have, how many touches he could get, how good he looks in the offense. But I think if we're just viewing this from how do you value them before the draft to now, looking at the team's reaction, thinking about how they're just going to give him the opportunity to produce, I like the landing spot a lot. I moved him up into the mid 12th round. So... Those are the running backs that have risen the most in my rankings after the draft. I'll go over wide receivers on Friday, but if you want to see my full rankings and maybe take advantage of some early ADPs on underdog before ADPs start to lock in this summer, you can see that. You can download my rankings, upload them directly to underdog on my website, thefansfootballadvice.com. That, my friends, is the next one. Hope you all enjoyed. If you did, hop a hang the like button, hop a subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Thanks for watching.